great presentation yeah. thank you for uh, sharing about your great journey uh, with uh, our uh, faculty colleagues and students at purdue uh, one question i had was if you have had interactions with or how do you see the role of professional societies such as ieee such as aiche such as asme and other uh, professional societies not just in engineering but across the uh, profession yeah no it's a great uh, question um we have not the honest truth is we've done we haven't done as much as we can and should with professional societies to date um we've got communities that we've you know or associations there's a group called mission link for example in dc um that we're actively collaborating with you know it's a community of 800 entrepreneurs um that have built over 10 years you know they they have a cohort based model they bring in 80 every year but these are now 800 entrepreneurs that have built mission oriented companies right and so how are we looking to collaborate with them and this could be how we collaborate with an IEEE or others um is as we uh are looking at these innovations that we spin out from DARPA and NSF you know again our theory on the case is it's less about the technology it's about the talent you put around it right um and so being able to pulse those communities to say are there folks that you know are experts in this space that either as advisors or entrepreneurs or you know maybe even chairman depending on where they are in their life stage um want to be involved and i think that would be a way that we could really plug into the associations we're also collaborating on an effort with Georgetown at CSET um which is a center of security and emerging technology where we're trying to we're creating the first of its kind national like an entrepreneur network across each domain so that if you know a certain breakthrough or technology is getting developed you start can start thinking about like who are the people not just within the region cuz having been a vc this is what we do we just work our personal networks you know it's harder to work you know other people's networks and how do we do that right and technology is there today to be able to do that we just need to spend a, a little bit of uh capital to invest in that i don't know if anyone else wants to add anything to Uh, first of all it was really nice to listen to the talk that you had and of course i think everyone here probably has at some point thought about that uh, what i can do to make the world better while at and do it at scale and i think the only solution that humanity has come close to figuring this out is capitalism and how to implement that in such a way so that it uh, actually does go it is a very difficult problem as you properly addressed yeah and uh, you i think the main take away from today's talk when i was listening to you, you said that government's role is uh, uh you get the example of contracts so government can provide contracts to uh, uh to individuals who are willing to take up the challenges and that can help start a wheel of progress that can ultimately like create a dominant domino effect when more capital comes in and that can have a positive impact but what i was also expecting to hear was like uh so what we are talking about here is how to speed up the progress but there is another part that uh, maybe we are moving too fast for example if you take to take about artificial intelligence right yeah so what is happening is while definitely artificial intelligence has to be like developed at a very fast pace not only because of the uh, interesting problems that it can solve but also because there is like a global incentive in terms of politics like there are adversaries which are also working on it and you need to like figure it out fast but there is another counter uh, there is another problem here that is that uh, the impact that will have it, it will have on the public affairs right so for example like uh automation will in any kind of automation will in general over a course of decade will lead to like uh, removal of jobs and these kind of things while at the same time creating jobs so what i was uh, also hoping to hear was that how uh, how do you collaborate with government to make sure not only that the wheel of progress moves faster but also it makes uh, it moves in a way so that there is no collateral damage yeah no it's a good question um look it, i think it, it it's you know on that point you know again part of the theory on the case here is talent right part of the you know cuz again when we say government you know it sounds like a black box let's take your ai example right um if you really want government to be engaged and think about collateral damage you need people inside a government that are really understand ai 
They're not there. So it's easy to sit here and go, hey, government needs to regulate. They need to do A, B, C. But if the people don't understand the technology that they're regulating, you're going to have potentially have more unintended consequences. Right? You know, so you take Biden's AI executive order. Um, you know, directionally, it's right. You know, every agency should have a chief AI officer. Every agency should have at least 100 people that are, you know, AI versant. But let's then look at where we are today. Like, those jobs are still empty. So this is why, again, I, I think the, the, the theory on the case of how it reconciles with what we're trying to do at Noble Reach is we need to create that pipeline. We need to create that infrastructure where when we have these surges happen, there's a way to get these people in. Right? And it, it's, it's not just young people coming from Purdue or, you know, top engineering schools. It's mid-career folks and, you know, senior folks being able to take a one-year thing from Google or Facebook or, you know, um, Microsoft or Amazon and being able to come in. And there's some of that thinking going on, but we don't have enough of those. We don't have the infrastructure set up yet. That, I think, is more the breakdown, right? Because I think the only way you really, you know, start to regulate um, collateral damage when it comes to technological advancement is getting more technological versant people in on the policy side. Because without that, you know, people can feel good that they just did something, but we don't know if it's the right thing, right? In many of these cases, you don't know anyways for time, but you'd feel better if they were at least much more versant on the technology. So uh, again, I, I always default back to talent being the critical element here um, of, of how we do this. You go ahead, Tony. i just say one other thing. Um, you know, the exchange of people between industry and government has not been a trusted uh, facility for, for a few years. And so putting this trust in place so that there's an entity like a Noble Reach or even other entities that can help facilitate that creates the, the talent exchange that needs to occur, but does it in a way in which each best interests are at, at heart. And I think that's really important. I think Simon, you know, it's point um, is, you know, we need more people that are kind of tri-sector athletes, right? Like, ideally, you don't want to just have somebody that's in the private sector and someone in, is in government and they like, you know, um, the, the uh, word I would use, um, a word that was shared with me, the CTO with the CIA is a gentleman named Nand Mulchandani. And Nand is a four times Valley CEO, founder. And now he finds himself inside the CIA. Uh, he previously was at DOD. And he likes to say, I'm a dual citizen. And it's actually a really powerful way to think about what he does, right? Because he's like, I'm a valley citizen and I'm a government citizen. And when you're a dual citizen, you know, it's not like I just came into your... When you say, like, we're just going to get these people from the private sector to come in and swoop in, that doesn't imply trust right away, right? But when you have dual citizens, as many of us, you know, may, you know, have been or associate ourselves with, you know, two countries, you know, when you're in this country... You know, your, your friends from your other country come visit you and you're able to show them around and show them a, a more personalized experience based on the trust and goodwill you have with your folks here. And when you go back to your home country and your visiting friends come and visit you there, you show them a more personal. But it's all built on trust. We need more dual citizens. Right. And that's that's the that's the idea of, of, of starting this through this. I'm not saying this is the end solution by any stretch. Your point's a good one, but it, you know, I think that's what you need more of. So expanding upon that point of dual citizens, yeah. let me put it this way. So in at least in Europe and in other parts of, let's say, Japan and more advanced uh, countries, which may not have had as much economic AI success, but whether you're talking about large language models like Mistral or the team behind Llama, which was based out of uh, Meta's office in Paris, mm -hmm. you can see that uh, those countries have started uh, influencing their policies geared towards getting the top talent, which is, you, as you mentioned, is the key part by considering the kind of institutes and universities they've been part of. So I was just looking at, so like Simon is from Melbourne, right? Linda is from Berlin, right? So you have top academicians, top people from across the world in the top universities. I know for a fact that Japan, UK, like trusted partners have started considering 
the kind of background that people have to influence, let's say, immigration policies. You being so close to, let's say, power corridors, have you thought about making sure that the U.S. immigration system, which a lot of Valley CEOs also struggle with, has something on the lines of its European partners, where, let's say, somebody coming from top universities in Europe, Japan, or UK, get an easier access rather than, you know, making it all gun for hell leather? Yeah, yeah. No, it's a, it, it's a good question. The short answer is no, we haven't. Um, and for no other reason than there's only so much we can do. And we have to prioritize. Um, you know, there's a lot of other issues that we can take on. Um, but we got to get this program off. You know, we got to get what we're doing going. We have to have this partnership with Purdue working. So is that something we would consider down the road? Yes. Um, but, you know, look, if there's one thing I learned in being a VC for 20 years is that entrepreneurs that don't focus fail, right? And, and I, we view ourselves as right now, you know, in a, a pretty entrepreneurial endeavor. So we have to focus. But that's the only reason. I'm not saying your point's not uh, an accurate point. It's just not something we can take on right now. I'll ask a question since I have a mic. Um, so if I'm a, a first year engineering student here, I have lots of opportunities and I might be trying to figure out how I'm gonna make my impact. So how do I go about figuring out what my purpose is? And if my purpose is uh, aligned with going into government maybe later on, uh, what skills should I try to develop to make an impact right away? Um, you know, look, I think, uh, if it is to go into, and look, we've got folks that have spent more time in government than I have, and I'll let them add to it. But, you know, my initial thought on that would be, from a skills perspective, is the diversity of experiences you have. Right? I actually think that is a skill. Right? You know, when people go in and do the same thing at different, you know, over and over and over again for their internships, you're not really getting you know, that that's helping you kind of get the next job, but it's not setting yourself up for the longer term, right? And so you have to think about how you're using your internships in this context. Um, it's why I think, you know, doing something in government and doing something in outside or doing something with a startup, you know, gives you a, a different pulse. Because I think it's hard for students in a vacuum to think about what, what, what really is their purpose um, until they put themselves actually in those ecosystems and see, or, do these peeps resonate with me? Do I resonate with them, right? Are they speaking my language? Um, as we were chatting with students earlier, you know, we even said, look, even if you go into government for a year, we're not saying, we're not suggesting someone needs to be having a career in government. But even, you know, for the rest of your life, you'll be able to, you'll, you'll say when you sit in a meeting, oh yeah, I was at NIH for a year. And you'll be surprised that if on the other side, you're dealing with someone that's in government, it means something. There's an implicit trust there, right? So creating those multiple avenues where you've had a diversity experience where you can build trust, I think is really helpful when you're, uh, you know, younger in your career. You know, I think, you know, it's the anti-Malcolm Gladwell outliers model, right? I don't believe in the 10,000 hours thing, right? I, you know, and, and we talked about this with students. I think our big problems are gonna get solved by folks that know how to play at the intersections right, that know how to speak the language of different parties and, you know, be the translator. And then implicit in that is have shared trust. Um, and I, you know, especially in the world of AI, look, I think, you know, individuals that build trust in their careers are gonna be invaluable. Um, but I'll let others add to it. You know, I started my career uh, early on in my, in my, you know, after I graduated from college, I went into, to government and I was recruited uh, by the intelligence community. And I think the, the reason why that attracted me and why I was attractive to them is as Arun had said, it's really building the relationships and it's, it's really getting out there. And you know, that's why one of the major reasons why El Noble Reach and Purdue have come together with this certificate program, it provides you the opportunity to develop those relationships. And that's in the, the course that's being taught right now, uh, bringing in Purdue alumni talking about their great careers that they're having right now in public service and other people that are coming in and talking about that. You're developing relationships with them and then you're building your network. 
And that network of trust, as Arun had talked about, is truly essential. And I think that that's why I was so motivated to go into public service and had a great career and continue to have that great career. And again, it's building that trust and developing those networks and relationships. So if you haven't signed up yet for the certificate program, do it. There are so many classes and so many opportunities and so many internships that you can get into that is not offered anywhere else in the US, which is why we're taking that effort to do this together to be extremely successful, extremely successful for you. So that that's, I think that's a great opportunity for you. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll jump in real quick here too. Um, something I shared with the students earlier was, you know, embrace opportunities when they present themselves. Um, I, you know, as a postdoc at Georgetown, got the opportunity to work on a book project. Um, and, you know, at least in my field, Working on a book project pre-tenure is kind of like the kiss of death for, for trying to get tenure. Um, but it opened a world to me and, and unlocked a passion in me for something that I had nothing, I had no knowledge of. And, and so I, I would really encourage you guys to think about opportunities um, horizontally, right, in, in, in kind of adjacent areas and, and things, uh, just to see, you know, what other, what other skills you can develop, what other experiences you can have. And, and I think that that embracing that type of, of career can unlock a lot of really fascinating opportunities for you guys. Just to complete the foursome, um, you know, you're not gonna find anything unless you go and seek it out. You can't make up the mission without the experience. And one of the things we talked about upstairs uh, with the students was, was some of our own individual discoveries of that mission. Be, be encourage encourage your peers, go into new, new opportunities. I feel like this is almost risk-free uh, in lots of respects, because if you think of what Arun talked about on the Teach for America side, you know, those people have expanded in multiple directions. We, we think the same thing can happen here. You have an opportunity to try new things without penalty. And that doesn't happen very often in careers. I know I've gone down the wrong path different times, but coming back to mission, coming back to a purpose, you'll really, you'll find that very rewarding. You know, the, the, the one thing I'll just circle back on is, um, look, in an age that we're entering into with AI, what are people most concerned about? They're concerned about disinformation, they're concerned about trust. How do you make yourself valuable? If there's a trust deficit, you become the trust broker. Right. If you're the person people trust, it means something. And that value is actually going to go up, not down, given everything else that's happening around us. Right? How do you, and then you start, you know, then you have unpack how do you build that trust? Like you don't just build trust saying, I trust you. Like it means you're putting yourself in different ecosystems, um, building relationships with different networks, not the same network. Right? I think that's, those are going to be incredibly valuable going forward. Good. Awesome. One more question? Sure. Oh. Oh, there is. Oh, back there in the corner. Um, I regret pointing to him, I bet, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, Ali here. I'm a first year PhD student. Uh, and I heard you talk about, it's a very specific point. I heard you talk about the Knight Tennessee Scholars uh, Program at Stanford. And I'd like you to compare and contrast your scholar program to theirs, if you just can give us a glimpse. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's more structural comparison than program. Um, the Knight Hennessy Program um, basically was running by John Hennessy, former president of Stanford. Um, and Phil Knight, the funder, hence Knight Hennessy, uh, their theory on the case was um, we need leaders, we need to teach leadership across all disciplines. Right? And so, but they're only doing it at Stanford, so that's one difference. We're trying to create a national more program and movement. So, but their, their, their thing was, you know, if you're a, a chem PhD, if you're a material science PhD, or an English major, grad student, or med school, or law school, um, you know, we should, we should have cohorts that think about leadership across disciplines. 
And so, you know, everyone's got their own, uh, you know, program that they're running in, but they're part of this cohort, you know, and that's where the examples come in, right? And in that cohort, you know, each person gets, you know, um, some level of mentorship, not necessarily someone from their domain. Um, they bring in speakers, right? So you'll have Condoleezza Rice come and talk to you about leadership. And, you know, like if you're an English major, you're like, oh, God, you know, we'll never have this experience. Um, but across different domains, what does it mean? And again, their idea that um, we really need to build leaders across disciplines, not just being taught at business school and, you know, in a couple of places. Um, and then they, you know, have programming. Um, you know, they create quarterly, kind of make sure you get together so there's a cohort-based experience so that even though you're grinding in your master's or graduate or PhD program, you know, you, you feel a sense of connection to these group. And the idea being that this is your cohort that you, in the community, the cohorts ahead of you and behind you, that you feel like you're part of, right? And that's, that's, where, that's where, again, structurally what we're trying to do with this, right? is that you're a noble reach scholar, but it's not only about being part of this cohort or the next cohort, but you're part of a community that, you know, in five or 10 years, hopefully there's, you know, we're a thousand of the, you know, the scholars around. And then maybe you now are a mentor to a new scholar, right? And it becomes self-reinforcing and it says something about you. Um, so that's, that's the, uh, uh, the structural parallels. Mm -hmm.